Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spinoff, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trainway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand-dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trainway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. You're ready to start a new project but don't have the right yarn. Or you have the yarn but not the right tool. Yarn Barn of Kansas can help. They stock a wide range of materials and equipment for knitting, weaving, spinning, and crochet. They ship all over the country, usually within one or two days of receiving the order. Plan your project this week and start working on it next week. Visit yarnbarn-ks.com to get started. I'm your host, Longthread Media co-founder Anne Marrow. Nan Kennedy is a shepherd, dyer, yarn maker, and all-around dynamo. She's based in Midcoast, Maine, where she's had a flock of sheep for 30 years. Nan, thanks so much for being with me. Thanks. It's been great to be here. So I'm going to ask you about every shepherd's favorite subject, which okay. is, Nan, could you tell me about your sheep? This sounds super boastful, but I think I have the only Polworth on the North and South American continents. I've been trying to find people that also have Polworth genetics so I can share. I want to very much create a new breed registry for the U.S. So I don't need to be proprietary at all, but I would love to develop what I think is a better Merino for the U.S. It's an Australian fine wool breed that was developed in the 1880s. It was obviously developed in a biome very much unlike ours, being that Australia is hot and dry and we are wet and cold. Uh, we also have fewer daylight hours, which is a thing when it comes to wool growth or anything else like egg laying, which is circadian. So there have been a few challenges that I did not anticipate and a few wins that I also did not anticipate. So that's pretty awesome. But it's a fine wool. Would you like me to keep going? Please, absolutely. <laughs> so what do you think makes it a better merino? Mm. Fine wool generally grows between five and eight pounds. Obviously, some of us have gotten, you know, have been able to increase our wool weights around that. The donor sires that I was able to collect semen from, and I love using semen in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I went originally to Australia. They um, they laughed at me that I only wanted 250 straws. So I jumped over to New Zealand, which is where I had trained back in the early 80s. And I love the country and I love the people, which is neither here nor there. I love everyone. But I did find some folks that were eager to participate and loved the idea of sharing their uh, genetics as the seed genetics for a new breed registry. The donor sires that we chose were shearing a 20, well, 9 to 11 kilogram fleece, which is 20 to 25 pounds, which is significant. You get that with a, you know, a longer staple, but also with a denser follicle pattern, which that's where I cre that's where I had a challenge, honestly, being that it's so wet here. Our winters have completely changed that they just simply don't dry well. Two years ago, it did nothing but rain from first of May to the first of July. So we couldn't shear until July. And at that point they were they were hot and they were itchy and they were and a lot of the wool got frankly rotten. So I've I'm now in the process of building or have just finished building a forty by eighty hoop house so that they will be able to stay warm and cozy and dry all winter, which is pretty darn awesome. So th that's been awesome. The other win that I did not anticipate was that where this had been a, this had been a, you know, a great production a farm with you know, many thousands of sheep station, whatever, in New Zealand, they also obviously track their, their lamb weights and so forth. So the lambs grew like gangbusters, which was very affirming. Yep. They also, I had anticipated starting fresh with parasite resistance, and that wasn't the case at all. Putting them up against my own that I had been tracking for years and filling accordingly ended up being actually more parasite resistant. So that was, that was really exciting to see. I've been very happy with the Polworth. It's a fine wool. It is not as 
fine as the super fine that I was growing. However, where I do all my production in, within a five hour radius of the farm, and we are very fortunate in New England that we still have remnants of what had been a vital textile industry back in the 19th century. Yes, it's aging equipment, but we still have some equipment. So, and, and knowledgeable people who run it, which is another key to the whole value chain. I'm able to, to do that, but it's mostly set up, frankly, for meat breeds, carpet breeds, dairy breeds, which are the bulk of the animals that are here. So my fine wool was, frankly, breaking in the process, which causes pilling and so forth. So I was happier to go from 15 to 18 milligrams. Frankly, now they are 17 to 22 milligrams. And I like that. I like, it works for me. There's still plenty of still very fine wool. There is no prickle factor. It is bouncy and juicy, and it has a little bit more shine to it. The Polworth is a hybrid of Merino crossed to a Lincoln and then crossed back to a Merino and a Merino and culled accordingly so that it's a stable fiber. Occasionally, there's a little bit of throwback, but I, I watch for that carefully on the bridge. I always watched for that because I had been breeding by recipe, if you will, since 1991 with my animals that were originally very hardy and off of the islands and a great hand spinning flock and good mothers and so forth. But I had only gotten my wool weights up to about 11 pounds and that wasn't enough to make a living. So you mentioned uh, 15 to 18 milligrams. Did you mean microns maybe? Ah, shoot. Dang. I did mean microns. And I'm sorry. I was stuck on kilograms and, on the wool weights. And I just, yeah. All yes, the ma'am. Yeah. All the, uh-huh. It's so complicated. Uh-huh. So you mm-hmm. started off with a hand spinner's flock and then moved more toward production. I did. I, the intent was always production. But the animals that I could find when I first started, these were the nicest animals, frankly, I could find. It was a flock dispersal and it was a happy, a happy moment for everyone. Were they all, you mentioned that they had been fine wools before. Were you working with merinos before? The animals that I purchased, and that was back in 1990, were, they were a little bit of a hodgepodge. They were nice and shiny. I had trained on Romneys, which of course I love. A couple things. The farm where I had trained, she had also isolated the murret gene. So people would come from all over the country and deliver their ladies to breed to her murat ram. And I love color. So this was an, an this was a flock that had a nice range of colors, a nice range of shine and good mothers and great hooves. And some were obviously naturalized to my, you know, to my climate, being that my pastures were at the time very rough. This is a hillside location top of the watershed location. So it's glacial moraine in some places. It's very rocky in others. It's There is a, a valley where the soils are a little bit better and a little bit wetter. So it's got, you know, it's got a, a, a nice mix. That means that in my, I can work my rotation around the summer seasons and so forth. So the intent was, was always production and to in, increase the numbers. In the beginning, I had more grass than I had animals. So I had to do, I had to make hay or I had to clip, which was fine because I was trying to always increase the soil quality and get the grass working, get the, get the, the microbes working and so forth um, a little bit better that some of the pastures had frankly gotten a little bit full of things like juniper and so forth, goldenrod or whatever. So, so there was a fair bit of work to get, get some of that, some of them back. So clipping was, was indicated. So the intent was always production. Honestly, when I started figuring out what I could do to make a living, and of course, initially, I was just trying to cover my costs. I was looking for which products had the highest margins. And pretty quickly, I figured out that for me, I developed a dye system. The dye system was awesome and getting getting perfected or getting improved, I should say. So I was able to increase my numbers to be a better fit for my grasses as my improves were so as my soils were improving so that I could match 
the numbers of animals to the amount of forage. And it was a very slow process, but we got there. In the beginning, I had to very quickly, I had to nonetheless augment my source, my wool source with my own because I had more demand than I had wool that I could grow. And now a word from our sponsors. The Adirondack Wool and Arts Festival is the perfect way to spend a weekend surrounded by over 150 craft vendors in Greenwich, New York. Discover a curated group of vendors featuring the best of wool and artisan crafters. Throughout the weekend, enjoy workshops, free horse-drawn wagon rides, free kids' crafts, a fiber sheep show, and a sanctioned cashmere goat show. Join us September 21st and 22nd, 2024, and every fall. For more information, visit adkwoolandarts.com. That's A-D-K-W-O-O-L-A-N-D-A-R-T-S dot com. And now back to the show. So how many animals do you have? You mentioned growing, and, and what, what is the size of your farm? Right now, well, the size of the farm, acreage-wise, is about 120. About a third of that is now improved pasture. The balance of it is mostly in a forestry plan. I like to keep the full diversity. I like to keep the coyotes on the other side of the stream (laughs) (laughs) where I have planted plenty of fruit trees and chestnut trees and things that they will eat over there and the deer are over there and so forth. But again, I like the, I really like the biodiversity of it all. The 40 acres that are on this side are now, have got great soil and have got great forage mix. I mean, I drive through it in my buggy and just think, Wow, there's a salad I'd I'd like to eat. You know, it's just it's it's <laughs> juicy and green and alive. And the monarchs have arrived this week, and it's just very exciting. The bobolinks have just fledged, but um, it's a whole system for sure. The number of animals right now today is about 175. I've had as many as 250, and that was too many, so I did cut back. Now that I'm building this barn, of course, I can keep more animals if I want to with some of them undercover in a more of a feedlot or a confinement system, which frankly, I'm not in favor of. I would much prefer to have animals in in a grazing pattern. And that's why I always have, always have done it. I will bring my lambs in for weaning at some point soon so I can do a better job of keeping grain in front of them while it's still raining and the grain's not getting, you know, wet and disgusting and where the birds are not (laughs) and where the chickens don't come in and kick the grain around and frankly vector whatever might get vectored from from the soil and create a potential for for any kind of other disease. There really is such a sense of place in in all sorts of farming and shepherding, but you know, you're in you're in mid coast Maine and so the soil and the water and the and all of the sort of landscape involved is so particular to your place. And so learning to be a shepherd where you are is a little different from learning to be a shepherd, certainly where I am in Colorado. That is very true. And I was a little bit disappointed having trained in New Zealand where the soils are pretty awesome and the sun is pretty awesome and they've been <laughs> doing it for a long time. So their biomes were well-developed and pretty darn awesome. So yeah, I was not anticipating that the regrowth would be so slow. It kind of works out now because, of course, we have, it's so darn wet now. I mean, our weather has changed that I feel pretty strongly about leaving a, a longer resting period, at least two months now between grazings so that we don't have parasite bloom. Haven't really been able to nail that one the last couple of years. It's, whew, last year was so wet that it's like the parasites just never quit. Didn't, you know, didn't matter how long the livestock were off. Yeah, they just, it was, appeared to be a a perfect storm of environmental factors for them. Our soil is also very acid here. All of our pine trees and just all of the rain we get is, our rain is pretty darn acidic now. So even though in regenerative grazing, the concept is that if you keep rotating and building your soils and you know spreading your manure from the winter, and that is one of our advantages, of course, we have to feed in the winter. So, so I import a lot of carbonaceous material that becomes 
fabulous compost that goes onto the back onto the soil and in, in the system. So I'm that's another way of building it. But I definitely have to lime every few years. It's it's it does not regulate itself in this environment, or I have not found it to regulate itself well enough in this environment. Perhaps there are things that I could do better, and I look forward to learning what they are. <laughs> So what was it that made you, you know, before before you went to New Zealand and and brought in this Polworth flock and but and even before that you had animals, what made you decide, I think I want to be a shepherd? <laughs> <laughs> Such a hard one. There were so many different things that pointed in that direction, starting with sitting in my grandmother's farmhouse when I was five and she taught me to knit and cook and do other things and then died the, the next year of cancer. So anything she taught me, like pruning fruit trees and, and everything was just so precious, my time that I had spent with her. So there was that. I had also had the incredible fortune have growing, of having grown up on a thousand acre peninsula in the lake, which had been an old farm. The farmhouse I lived in, which was next to hers, was built in the 1790s. So the cellar, for instance, had over in the corner, it had a, you could see where they used to boil the pigs to take the hides off. And there was a fireplace in the kitchen that had bricks in it that were made by, you know, the woman who'd lived there. And I knew where the clay deposits were and so forth. So I loved this integration. It was the 70s too. It was the back to the land movement, 60s and 70s. And so there was all this sort of very interesting home art that I definitely wanted to integrate, I think, into a lifestyle. But more importantly, I was watching, you know, the main that I loved was based on a whole value chain that started with farming, forestry, and the fisheries. You know, there was the tanning industry that depended on the hemlocks in order to have the tannins to do what they did. There was the shoe factories that then took the, you know, that then took the leather goods and turned it into shoes. There was lots of textile industry. There was the fisheries. I lived close enough to what we called Camden by the sea and Rockland by the smell. So <laughs> that's where a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of fish processing went on and so forth. FMC was doing carrageenan for, anyway, I was just very much aware of how integral the resource industries were, not just to the resource, the raw material, but also to the full value chain. And I loved that. And I wanted to be part of that. I knew that there was little I could do to make, you know, I didn't, I didn't live next to the ocean. I didn't come from a fishing family. I lived in the woods, but I wasn't ever going to be a forester. I preferred to stay closer to the actual source production as much as I loved all of the making and so forth. So I chose farming. And I also had, a. I was, by the time I was 18, my garden was over an acre and I was feeding 150 people. So that was the early 80s. Well, no, that was the late 70s. Anyway, so I wanted, I, I decided I really wanted to stick with farming. I loved it. I loved being outside. I loved being, you know, I always loved being in nature. That was just, there was no question about that. And I loved, <laughs> I like to keep moving. My grandfather called me my petite Grenois, which is, you know, my little froggy. <laughs> I was always around, jumping around. It's hard for me to sit still. So yeah, it was a good fit. And then I, but in my woods, and understand my granddad had started a boys camp there. So I was not allowed up the hill at the boys camp. So I spent my days wandering around the woods, literally from the age of two. My mother put a cowbell around my neck and said, <laughs> okay, just stay within earshot. <laughs> and then at five, she said, okay, you can go down the road, but you know, stay out of the boats. So that was that was, oh, I'm going to go into the boats and find out what's in there. <laughs> so, And I could tell you that story as well. But boy, I learned a lot about boats that day. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I was very fortunate to have been able to have this huge backyard where I could see where they had built the stone walls, where there had been clearly a, a holding pen or whatever was in this square stone zone with these rock walls. Of course, it had all grown up with pines and, and a, a huge row of oaks along the, the line between my grandmother's farm and, and our farm. My imagination kind of ran wild. There was also, I was fortunate, there was a nature writer on the other end of the 
We lived on the West Neck. She lived on the East Neck. Elizabeth Coatsworth was her name, and she was a wonderful writer. And she wrote about stories of the old farms that were there, and she made them come alive for me. I was a reader. I did a lot of reading. And so it made sense. It was, you know, I was so much left to my own devices and my own thought process that, of course, we didn't have devices other than our own thought process process back then. <laughs> we didn't even have TV. We had we had three stations that would come in very fuzzy and and it was just a waste of time. So, you know, we played board games and marbles and you know, that kind of thing. So we kind of lived in a slightly different world than most kids probably did in you know mid century modern America. But uh or post mid century, I don't know, whatever, sixty, seventy <laughs> This is, I'm turning this into a much longer story than it really is. <laughs> and I don't remember the original question. <laughs> well, you know, so it, actually it, it makes perfect sense. So I asked you about how you came to be a shepherd. Mm-hmm. And when you were talking about sort of the back to the land movement, I feel like there's sort of been this arc where now where there's focus on capturing carbon and sustainability and right. realizing how right. being I a farmer it. can actually not only bring about the kind of lifestyle that you want to see, but it can also improve the quality of life for everybody. Right. So in the end, I chose wanting to be involved with agriculture. The vegetables didn't talk back to me. There wasn't a, <laughs> there wasn't a ton of love there. I also very clearly had a relationship with animals. I also could whistle. I had a great whistle and the, you know, all the dogs listened to me. I used to train horses when I was pretty young and I just saw it, but I decided, and my dad refused to let me have a horse. So I had to figure out how can I have a farm that I can sneak a horse in that it won't show up in the budget and I can, you know, have my cake and eat it too. But it had to make money. It, you know, I obviously didn't, never had a plan that someone else was going to take care of me. So it, so I chose sheep because they were multi commodity. Originally, I was sort of thinking they were dual commodity with the, the meat and the fiber. And of course, sheep dairying became, you know, a thing and that was exciting. And some of my original business planning included all three, but I realized pretty quickly that I needed to focus, you know, on what I was good at and also what the breed I would choose was was best at. That was the other happy accident, as I mentioned, about the Polworth, which was very different than the Merino, was that was that the lambs grew fast and furious. So at this point, it's generally considered that fiber farming is a really challenging way to kind of make a living. So thinking about I'm going to support myself with fiber farming sounds very surprising, I think, to people who have been talking to other shepherds. You're right. I really started building the budgets back in the big, in the early 90s. My initial plan was that I would sell enough meat to meet my variable costs And then any of my wool sales would be sort of the takeoff point for whatever would end up at my pocket. That it costs so much more to farm now that, and I have so many animals that honestly I can't sell enough meat at the, the value of meat has no way kept up with the cost to raise it. Uh, We are such price takers and there is so much downward pressure on all of our products. There was Australian lamb chops on sale last week at Hannaford for seven ninety nine a pound. You know, it's just how could they possibly raise it for that price? I, I don't, I don't know. And then, and then get it here, and then actually retail it at Hannaford Supermarket. So, so that didn't make any sense. Yeah. So, so I can't possibly make a living selling the meat, but I figured out how to develop a relationship with. A mill that 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 would that would make my yarn at a value that that made sense, but because of the dye processing, it's the dye that really makes that really makes it all work. I developed what I wanted to create something that was china proof, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I wanted to be able to have a niche and hang on to it that somebody else couldn't emulate and then scale in a way that would leave me in the dust. So I so. I wanted it to be very sort of indigenous, if you will. So I, and taking some of my inspiration from Easter eggs with my kids, I developed a process with food grade dyes and food grade acids in seawater and using solar power. So I, I created these 
solar vats. So it's passive solar initially and continued to sort of perfect or tweak the recipe so that it was good and color fast. And then I built a solar thermal system with the help of some grant making from the Maine Technology Institute because I was in a technology sector that they wanted to help build. So I've, I've been somewhat fortunate being doing both pre-harvest raw material production as well as post-harvest manufacturing that I've been in a couple of identified areas that where assistance was available because there were opportunities of you know, need and growth. And uh, I've been fortunate to leverage that on both ends with so I've been able to build my infrastructure both for the production as well as the processing. The challenge for farmers, as I see it, is that every year we have to make investments on three different levels. One, of course, is our is the infrastructure. We always have to keep either building or doing repairs and maintenance to our infrastructure. The second one is our variable costs, which you know you got to put into your product every year, which is includes it also includes time and sweat equity and then the third is your knowledge and your education you got to keep educating yourself and staying ahead of all of the different elements in both pre and as well as post harvest as well as the market as well as the technology to access the market and honestly at this point in my aging brain it's getting a little more difficult <laughs> I need a team. <laughs> yeah, that's very complex. So I had heard about your your dyeing process, which I think is really surprising and unique. That, so, you know, you mentioned that it kind of came from Easter egg dyeing, but seawater, that is not something I'd ever heard of before. Tell me about that. Sure. Easter egg dye was a, just a, a food coloring. And of course, food coloring doesn't really, isn't really color fast in a protein. So I had to figure out how to do a better job of dyeing a protein fiber, which requires salt and acidity, as well as a color agent and heat, a dyer's boil. Um, I had done a bunch of natural dyes for a a long time. So I sort of had some of that chemistry and some of that, some of that thinking down. I did find that the natural dyes personally, I, you know, there's a lot of time involved if I wanted to scale it. For collection, and then there was a disposal issue. Certainly, with the metals that I was having to use, either alum or chrome, or anyway, there's yeah, you know, there was problem with with that copper. Copper was a real problem because I didn't want copper near my sheep. And then I started buying some of the wash fast acid dyes and working with them. Still was concerned about disposal. Still. But I also was in developing the recipes for them. I was found myself dumping a bunch of salt into the water. And I thought, well, geez, I live in Maine where we have a wonderful resource of clean salt water. Now doing this, I was trying to tweak the recipes so that I could do them in a solar vat system. And I thought, well, geez, we've got the seawater. We've got got the the sunshine. sunshine. This is why people come to Maine. So Let's figure out how how I can use this and leverage it as a real main, as a main thing, as a main niche, especially where I was selling at farmer's markets, because it was very hard. At this point, I was a single mom and a solo farmer, could only get so far from home. So I was, farmer's markets were, were my, were my best outlet for marketing. Yeah. So that's how I got there. And I figured probably other parts of the world don't have the advantage of so much clean seawater, and and there you have it. So, seawater has something has all kinds of stuff other than sodium chloride in there. What else is in there that it does? And yeah. actually, I, I it's a very good point, and it's part of the magic. I you know I think yeah. that there's there are certain naturally occurring elements that I think temper the color a little bit, and I absolutely work with that. In each vat is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Best I can tell you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned earlier about there being more more demand. Is your primary product then dyed yarn, or what? 
on the other hand, I, I asked that question, and, and if there's anything I know about shepherds, it's that you have to have multiple, I would say, irons in the fire, so to speak. Yeah. Well, that's two questions or two, <laughs> two thought processes. I think one of the biggest challenges for anyone who is a producer and especially a creative enough producer to get themselves into this jam pot is that they want to make everything. They want to do everything. They see that there's an opportunity and they want to grab it. And one of the hardest things, frankly, for me has been to learn to focus. You know, I still love to garden. I still want to have beautiful flowers. You know, I still want to have a mown lawn. Well, now I find that, for instance, a mown lawn is not good for the pollinators. So I'm not going to mow my lawn anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to graze it with the sheep, for instance. But I have discovered the importance of focusing basically along the value chain. In other words, I am vertically integrated, but I'm also horizontally integrated in the fact that I have the raw inventory and then I, I have to take, it's a pretty huge pot of gold in order to take something from raw and do a minimum production run of scouring and carding and spinning yarn and or plying it as it is in the case for a knitting worsted. So I have inventory that is at that stage of the game. And then I take that and I dye a whole bunch of it. So I have dyed inventory. And then I take a bunch of that and I have <laughs> I have developed all these, you know, knitwear designs that I've, you know, developed over the last 30, 40 years. And then I have the sweaters, which I don't do online. They're all in person, but I do give the patterns as a as a tickler for people to buy a sweater's worth of yarn kind of thing if they don't want to just buy one one skein. But then some of the wool, frankly, doesn't, quote, make grade. Okay, so I told you that I quickly outgrew. <sighs> My market was more than what I could grow. So I contracted with the Main Sheep Breeders Association frankly, uh, to buy all of their wool and grade it and wow. develop a blanket, knowing mm -hmm. that, first of all, I was aware since I was doing farmer's markets and that was really summer. I had plenty of income in the summer, but then I found that I had lots of costs and not a whole lot of income in the winter. So I wanted to create a product that I felt would pick up the slack, that I would have more income in the winter and, frankly, fewer costs specifically for that product because they would have already been assumed during my higher cash flow months. So I thought, well, blankets, that's a perfect fit for Maine. And I went, I also, my postgraduate, my undergraduate degree was the sociology of art. So I was, you know, I loved art and all of that. So I did actually have some of that training. So I went to the museum and our local incredible, wonderful museum in Maine and went through their archives, was very fortunate to have gotten invited into their archives and take photographs of the blankets in their collection and get provenance for the different blankets in the collection. The original intent was to do sort of different, different blankets from different townships. I knew the history of how we, many of these small towns, in fact, some of the original income that the women could make off of the farms, like the one where I grew up, was from their spinning. And then there was someone not unlike a milk truck that would come around and pick up their hand spinning and it would go into woven products at the local mill and it would take five spinners for, for one hand weaver. But you can imagine how much hand spinning it would take to go into a, into a small water powered loom sy system. Anyway, so that was really some of the first income that was being produced on these early subsistence farms back in the 19th, 18th centuries, 18th centuries, I guess. And it's all written in a book called Keep Me Warm One Night. And you know, I, anyway, so so the original thought was, well, I'll do a different blanket and different, you know, towns and, it, and tell the stories and be part of the history and have it be part of a living history project. Well, that was really complicated. And <laughs> yeah. we settled on one design and that was good. It was hard to get the mills to do different designs. It meant building a different chain for different designs every year. And it was never exact. And they didn't 
you know, really have images of the whole blanket. And so we were kind of, um, we taking some artistic license as it was. So, and I was trying to focus again. It's like, focus, Nan, focus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the yarn it, and what is called Sea Colors Yarnery is all of the dye processing. The yarnery ended up making about as much gross income as the blankets. There is more of my sweat equity in the yarns because of all the dye processing than the blankets. But the And the blankets were particularly special because I also was dyeing the yarn for them. As I was buying more wool, what I discovered was not much of it was fine wool. I was lucky if 20% of the state wool crop was of sufficient grade that I felt comfortable putting it into a wearable garment that would be anywhere touching the skin, uh, near the skin. The rest of it, I, you know, I had to come up with a product. So that was, you know, blankets is, is what made sense. Blankets is what we had enough textile production in the industry to do locally. So I hope I'm not repeating myself only to say that that's, you know, and we had a historical relevance in order to sort of make it fit into today's context, I think. Yeah. And who doesn't, who doesn't love a wool blanket? Absolutely. The sad thing, <laughs> I know, right? The sad thing is that during COVID, the post weaving equipment and a lot of people don't understand. They always say, well, where do you, where are your blankets woven? Well, shoo-wee, there's probably five different, you know, mills involved in order to do each stage of the game. And the last stage is after washing and drying, they then get fold and nap before they then get cut and sewn and labeled and bagged and so forth and so on. The napper, a 96 inch napper, one socket napper from the I guess it must have been early 20th century. The last of the nappers got scrapped during COVID because because the mills were shut down. There was, you know, there was sort of a lag period. The lease had the lease had expired and though it was going to be moved, it was winter, the riggers didn't move it on time and the folks who owned the building decided it was worth scrapping. <laughs> they didn't want it in their way anymore. So it was a very, very sad story for the industry. I'm still trying to figure out how is this possibly a, a blessing in disguise? Is there still some COVID money out there that we might be able to buy a new napper? The nappers that I've priced out of Italy are about a half million bucks and you know, to get them here. And then you got to house them and then you got to staff them and you got to find people who know how to do that sort of thing. And so it's not a cheap proposition, but honestly, I get inquiries at least once a day saying, where's your blankets? I need another blanket. I love your blanket. Best blanket I ever had. Man, these blankets are awesome. I want my whole family to have blankets. I, you know, And on it goes. And it's just so sad for me because the blankets were amazing. They were thick and juicy and soft. And I'd love to get back there again. So I'm not going to quit looking for a napper. I've got people down in the Carolinas that are looking in all kinds of abandoned warehouses trying to find <laughs> trying to find me a 96 inch napper. If anyone's listening to this podcast today and you know of a 96 inch napper, I know where we can put it and I know where we can staff it and it would be awesome to be back in business. So that is, you know, still a dream. I mean, maybe it's maybe there's a silver lining, who knows? Or maybe someone has a half million dollars they want to put into the textile industry because we have still have the people, the places, the expertise, the history, all of the parts of the puzzle that make it just beautiful and regenerative and important. I don't know. It seems to me that our last administration was collecting an awful lot of tariff money. I don't really know where that tariff money went, for instance. It would be wonderful to know if perhaps some of that could go into actually rebuilding some of our manufacturing industry, which I thought was the intent. And I, I was excited about that, quite frankly. Yeah, there are so many places in which textiles, be it garments or or sort of usable goods, are where there isn't demand for something created in, in the U.S. or demand for something created in a sustainable process. So it does seem like in places where we could we could make that happen, wouldn't it be really great if we could focus a little energy on keeping something going instead of lamenting its demise? 
That's exactly correct. And I guess that's sort of why I decided to, and this is, you just answered the question that I, that you asked earlier, which is why I decided to dig into wool, even though it was against all odds, it was a, it was a dying sector. It was a dying industry. It was a, it was just ridiculous. At the time when I was trying to develop the blanket, which was the late nineties, of course, NAFTA had come along. And every time I call another mill that I I knew I needed for the next piece of the puzzle. They were like, ah, we're just finishing up our last run and ah, we're going to sell that piece of equipment or it's being sent over overseas or it's going to be scrapped. And and then interestingly enough, along came the 2000s and all kinds of folks that used to work in mills would come to my booth and just look, stand there and say, Oh, I loved working in the mill or, oh, this is, you know, I can't believe you're doing this. And, you know, most of our equipment is gone now, but I'd love to, if you ever get, if it ever comes back, call me, I'd love to work for the, you know, it's all there. The the energy is there. The love is there and um, it could happen. Well, and taking advantage of, taking advantage of people who still have that expertise and knowledge while we still have them, because folks who are retiring out of an industry there's a span of time during which they're still available and remember how it worked, et cetera. So all that, having all that knowledge just go away is is disappointing. It's disappointing. It's kind of tragic, actually. And we don't have any... I've tried to talk to our vocational schools about trying to keep some of this alive, even if they had to teach it off-site in some of these industry locations. A lot of the fiber arts programs, I've talk to people that have been through that have a quote fiber arts degree and they don't even know about the different grades of sheep or the different types of fiber for them just you know wool is wool it's just it's a strand that they and they learn how to to do the machinery but they don't understand the critical nuances to what what makes a a different fiber for something that is going to have a stretchy springy juicy dynamic versus something that's going to be sort of worsted and tight and with a shiny nap. I mean, so much of that information is also gone, which is fascinating. And yes, that was a huge part of how come we lost the napper. The fellows, they were in their seventies and it, they were just, they were not almost 80 and they were just, you know, this is, they, they, after, you know, post COVID, they just weren't going to gear back up again. There was a resting period in which they had found other things to do, like take care of their grandchildren and travel and have <laughs> right. a life. And it yeah. was pretty cool. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Man, as we're talking, one of the things I noticed is that you started off as somebody who who got into this to, to, to sort of live your values. And there's certainly, there's a lot of your artistic eye and a lot of heart, but I keep hearing vocabulary that is very much kind of a pragmatic business approach, which is certainly something everybody who has a small business would have to know to some extent, but you are definitely thinking about this with a business eye toward it. And I I just think that that's so interesting that you would have obviously would have had to develop that in order to keep going. But where does that fit in for you? My postgraduate was in ag and resource economics. (laughs) (laughs) So that was a thing. Yeah. And I used to read a lot and so forth because it's important to me to, uh, because I'm a New England Yankee and Self-reliance is really important, and I never expected somebody else to pay my bills or feed me or house me or clothe me or take care of me. So that's a thing. But it's also really important to me that success, I've also been the president of the Maine Sustainable Agriculture Society and whatnot. So it's always been a critical theme to me that, yes, you do the right thing, but it sure as heck has to make economic sense in a way that that is good today, but good forever. I consider myself the steward today on this land. I started to save to buy a farm when I was 12. And I called it my future farm fund. And I worked every summer. And I worked weekends as a, you know, babysitting or cleaning out muck installs or doing whatever I could do. Um, By the time I got into a little older, I started working in restaurants where I could make a little bit better bank. And it all went I was able because I was living at home. I didn't I didn't have a lot of overhead. <laughs> Where I live, you don't go out to eat anyways. <laughs> so I <laughs> didn't have a lot of expenses. But I don't think a lot of people don't even think about saving anymore. But um I was I was 
one of my grandparents had opened a savings account for me when I was very young and I just enjoyed watching it grow. It was fun for me. So, so yeah, I had enough for a down payment for my farm when I was 25 years old. And I was pretty focused on how I was then going to make that, make that investment that I had worked so hard to get to make sure it stuck, that it was, you know, had to make economic sense. Of course, it would have been a much better return if I'd sold the land already. But, but honestly, I moved in. I spent two years restoring it. My ex-husband and I had been builders. It burned to the ground oh. in 1990. And that was, the economy was in a, in a hole. I really felt, and we lived in a, in an Airstream camper while we rebuilt. I sort of felt like it was our Conestoga wagon and we'd come across country and we had good land, but, and we had knowledge and we had hope, but that was pretty much all we had. So it's been a very, very long, slow process of recovery. And what was left of the, of the house was a, we call our local fire department, the seller savers. I hope no one from our local fire department is listening, but it's, you know, it's hard with a volunteer fire department in a rural area for them to get there in time to actually save a a burning structure. And this was all connected. It was a traditional connected old farm. So everything that was connected burned. So what was left was the old cellar hole to the house, which was about, which wasn't very big. And that became my die deck. I call it the beach. (laughs) Uh, I, I rebuilt that pretty quickly. I took whatever salvage materials I had and I thought to myself, you know, how am I going to get out of the hole? How how quickly can I generate an income? And that was that was where I decided I that's the thing I decided I could scale if I had enough yarn that I could add enough color that I could use my sweat equity well enough during a summer season and blast it out so that I could make enough yarn that I could sell it at farmers market and whatever was left over I could take to different shows. At the end of the season, I would go to New York Sheep and Wool Festival, which I loved. Before the season, during the during the the harvest in the pre-holiday season, I would sell at holiday shows, and then springtime would come along. And now, Maine in May back then, the first weekend in May, of course, is the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. We still got snow on the ground. It was like this big ripping noise to get Nan out of the state of Maine. I would go down to Maryland <laughs> and my goodness, they were already cutting their first crop of hay, <laughs> which was great because I, when I got home, I felt like I was way behind the eight ball and I'd just get snap into action again. So I, but I'd ha- have to have enough yarn to get down to Maryland and do, I've been doing Maryland since 2000, I guess. And yeah, so it just, it went from there. And then I was extremely fortunate that the internet came along. We had my ex husband had been a early internet adopter, so we already had connection and we already had you know been using that technology a little bit. And then, of course, he became my ex during the nineties. So I had two kids to feed, and that was a pretty good incentive. So during that time, you've also seen a lot of changes in the knitting industry, which which I'm assuming is the major buyer for your your dyed yarn. Is it mostly knitters or is it a whole variety of different fiber well, crafters? I, all kinds of fiber crafters. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't call knitting, yes, the industry in terms of how many yarn stores there used to be, they are fewer and farther between. I did not mention the fact that I had originally known that I had this fabulous yarn. I did go on a quest at one point trying to wholesale or resell in some capacity through yarn stores, they weren't particularly interested. They didn't understand the notion of farm yarns. They were also, I think, struggling. So it was not an easy fit for them at a, at a price point that, that that made a lot of sense. I think that they were concerned about yarn consumers that weren't necessarily prepared yet to pay the kind of prices that it would that it would take to make it work. So I would say that in terms of that landscape, I would sort of don't call that so much of an industry because I don't, at one point I had developed one of my patterns, my dress, which I love the Marilyn Monroe. I thought, wouldn't this be, I'm a curler. I thought, wouldn't this be great to be the dress for the U.S. curling team and blah, blah, blah. And my knitters couldn't possibly make enough of that. So that that didn't happen. (laughs) And then Ralph Lauren came (laughs) along. He has a lot of knitting. And then Ralph Lauren came along and did his thing. So that was, that was awesome. So that was a niche that was filled. Wasn't it Ralph? I think it was Ralph. Anyway, so 
And even originally, the consumers, the knitting consumers would, you know, I think it was $12.50 a skein. It was about a 250 yard skein at the time. Originally, I thought, oh, people would say, boy, oh boy, if I bought this yarn, my husband would kill me. And I would just look at them and say, you know, you need a new husband. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's honest to goodness, it's $40 a skein. And it is a fabulous value. It's a third longer. It's 270 yards. It's a third longer than a standard skein. And that's, you know, that's, it's a colored skein of merino that is thick and juicy. It's a lightweight merino, but of course, fine wool, three things. It's packaged by weight. So you get more yardage. Number two, there's more fibers spun around that core of air. So it, it blooms into the stitch, you know, it's thick and juicy and it blooms into the, into your stitch work. And number three, I can design the yarn with more twist without it ever feeling harsh. So it's extremely easy care and quite washable. And of course, I'm doing all my own shearing. After having bought all of the, going back to that part of the story, all the main yarn, I ended up, all the main wool, excuse me, I ended up working specifically with a handful of growers who were very good and brought in their fiber very clean. They took a lot of pride in their in their raw material, and I paid them four times what they would get for the commercial value as a commodity. So and so and and then I would go at shearing. I had I ended up with one very large grower. I would go at shearing and handle all the fleeces, so I knew that I was skirting it and grading it according to whatever was going to be the end use. So I was very careful about that. But I, you know, I'm so I'm very, very careful about about how each link in that chain is put up. You know, is handled, is packaged. I have uh, cedar warehouses. I have anyway. At this point, it's there's just tremendous care and tremendous quality control at every at every link of the chain. It, it's not perfect. <laughs> it's it's not perfect. Did I hear you say that you do your own shearing? I actually did go to shearing school. I used to do my own shearing. Oh After gosh. I got to about 50 sheep, I decided my time was more beneficial handling the animals and skirting the fleeces to upgrade the value so that the quality of the clip came, you know, came out the way I, I wanted it to be, packing the clip and so forth. So no, after I had about 50 sheets, um, which was... <laughs> there's <laughs> self-reliance 30, and then there's... 30 the, years ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So no, now there's two shearers and they come in and then we have a handful of good friends that are, that will come and skirt and, and so forth. My body can't handle it anymore. I've had Lyme disease for 41 years, so I don't have a lot of cartilage. I'm working on replacing all my joints one after the other got a new knee, a new hip, I got another new knee this this December. So I have to be very careful about the way I use my body. Shearing would not be one of the best uses for this particular body. (laughs) Pretty soon it's just going to be like a a vessel for my brain. (laughs) So Nan, I noticed that your website where where I went to learn more about you isn't something like main Polworth sheep or even sea colors yarnery. It's Get wool. Can you tell me about that? I sure can. I can tell you I also own those <laughs> those <laughs> those URLs. Yeah. But I I when I figured out that my customer, um, the, the way that I could stay alive with a customer that was more than 20 miles from my front door was through the internet, that I needed to choose a URL. And what I decided on was get wool, not got wool, which was available, but get wool, which really put the onus and it really put, uh, frankly, supported the notion that without the customer, we weren't ever going to really have, we weren't going to be able to close that loop. It was never going to be soil to soil. It was never going to be cradle to grave. You know, we were, things were changing. And I, yes, I wanted people to get wool, but I wanted them to find, have a place where they could could find really good wool and purchase it. But more importantly, I wanted them to get it. And whether in their heads, I wanted them to understand that this was an opportunity to be part of the exciting change that was potentially afoot. 
to build our microbial life and to keep our grassland birds alive and to keep our textile industries alive and to build regenerative systems and keep home knitters, my home knitters, working from home. All the things that were all the exciting parts of the value chain, that they were the reason it would all happen once they get wool. So it's kind of a call to action as much as a sort of a website. Exactly. It is very much a call to action. And we are we are on that precipice. It's interesting when 350.org came along, I immediately reached out and said, why don't you have it as one of your action items that people should be getting wool? You know, why don't... <laughs> and it still isn't a, a big thing, you know, for them. They, it doesn't... A lot of these dots are yet to be connected, but they will be as long as more of us that get it keep the faith keep mentioning the fact that uh, keep reaching out keep making it happen and yes it's a, been a bit of a crusade i cannot say that it hasn't been there's so many reasons i mean when i was in college learning about environmental you know environmental science in college it was i could see that there was already that there was plastic islands forming and so forth and it was very frightening back in the 90s people were or 80s even, I could see that they were getting all excited about this gross thing called polar fleece, which was just plastic. <laughs> yeah. <You> know? <laughs> I, I had been fortunate. Understand, it's only been 80 years. It's been my mother's lifetime that we developed all these synthetics, starting with rayon, which is you know the first of the cellulose plast- plasticized celluloses. Before that, all we had was cotton, wool, silk, and the bast fibers. My new blanket is a natural linen warp with a wool weft, which is Uh very exciting to me, which I've done because I really want to see us bring back a flax industry in this state. We're certainly this country. We know we can grow it, but we don't have any processing for flax as a textile into linen in this country. I mean, the first state that figured that out is going to be the one that's going to take all the custom work. I mean, there's huge economic opportunity. It's just a huge investment to get there. And it's not just an investment in the infrastructure. It's also an investment in the knowledge base. And it's also, you have to build the demand. And those kind of advertising dollars are the most expensive advertising dollars you can possibly spend. But it's happening now. There's a groundswell of people that are much more interested in figuring out how they can do their textiles and save the planet at the same time. Very exciting to me. Mm -hmm. It's taken a long time to get here and a lot of people keeping the faith along the way. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's happening. And thank you, Anne, for everything you do to also (laughs) make it happen. It's Awesome. Oh, there are just so many wonderful stories, and it really is inspiring. You know, I first came across your work. I actually found your yarn in an art gallery in Bath, mm-hmm. like an art, an artisan shop in in Bath. I think. Well, I was an owner. Yeah. Oh, really? I, I, I also tried that niche. Believe me, <laughs> I've tried marketing in every niche. Yeah, I was one of the five that started mm-hmm. that. But yeah, but it was around that same time that folks like Clara Parks of Knitters Review or I think Pam Allen is also a Mainer. So the knowledge, as you say, of people who were beyond your own immediate realm got to be more known. And and so the fiber shed movement is is very much about like within a certain number of hours or miles. But then we also have this sort of local, air quotes, local community of ideas and and values and purpose. So as much as having local fiber to me is important, it's also important to me to support the fiber production, domestic fiber production, local fiber production that happens to be not somewhere I can go visit it on a regular basis. I just want to know it's there and buy things. For awesome. Me. I <laughs> wish there were more people like you. <laughs> well, I think that a lot of the, certainly the, the, a lot of the the crafters or spinners or knitters or things like that are folks who want to participate in these things when they learn about them. So I'm excited. They to are the now. Out. They are now. Mm -hmm. And that's what I meant earlier, is that that wasn't initially the spirit, I think, of some of the of the knitters that I had engaged with 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a very good knitter. And I I I wasn't there to strut my stuff. I was there to knit and meet them and have fun and find out who was in my community, which was anyway. So, Nan, I can find you online at getwool.com. Is that right? 
Yes, it is. Will.com. And it's all up to you. <laughs> well, and I think that there's all kinds of adventures on there that we haven't even touched on, like your Airbnb, etc. So I'm just excited for folks to go explore that. I am too. There's an Airbnb where you can write yourself into the adventure here. There's also a small ruminant residency where I'm hoping part of my next chapter is going to be to do some of this generational transfer of knowledge that we're losing in the textile industry. I don't want to lose it in our shepherding industry. It's one thing to have a backyard flock and that's awesome. But if you actually want to become part of, I think, a textile future, if we want to have a future with a pasture, then we need to have good shepherds out there. And there are a lot of wonderful folks who have, for instance, purchased lovely farms, but they don't necessarily know what they're doing. So there is, I think, even potentially, so the small ruminant residency, you pay up front to learn. And then when you leave, you leave with a flock of sheep worth the same value that's in the breed program. And, you know, I'm hoping to be able to help place them on some of these farms where folks need a shepherd and want to have a regen, be part of the regenerative process, part of the regenerative, I think, energy that is afoot in this country, part of the solution that that suddenly we're realizing we have a solution. It's not all going to hell in a handbasket. Yep. And sheep are in it. So I love that. Well, thank you so much, Nan. I hope you have a great weekend as if a shepherd got such a thing. And I just look forward to learning more. Okay. Thanks so much, Anne. Great to meet you. Great to talk. Thanks to our sponsors for supporting the podcast. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again. Thanks again.